Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful to be with you. <laughs> Thank you for such a great welcome. It's great to be back with you. See such a wonderful, great crowd. Let's give Jesus the honor today. Lord, we thank you for your mighty works in our midst. We draw on you to touch our lives and hearts today. We thank you for this great church. We thank you for Pastor Kong and Son. We pray you'll continue to bless them and increase the ministry of this church through the nations. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give a lot of clap. Wonderful Jesus. Please be seated. It's great to be with you again. Bible school students are all getting excited. They get them into a frenzy. Last time I got there, they looked at me like I was a monster from another planet. I don't know what they had been saying before I got there. <laughs> so, uh, but it was good. And uh, we've just been up in Taiwan with uh, Pastor Ku and New Life and uh, uh, over 1,500 salvations in one week. What a phenomenal church, just amazing. And see so many entertainers, so many people come to Christ, and yet I know that the seeds of what's happening up there started here. Isn't it wonderful? And uh, so we never know just what influence we can have and how far it will go. So I have with me my beautiful wife, here she is, Joy. She's wonderful, getting lovelier every year. We have seven children. 19 grandchildren. Just we're multiplying and filling the earth. <laughs> and I have my eldest daughter, uh, Josephine, and her, her husband, Steve, my eldest son-in-law, is here with us today. It's their first time here. Fantastic. We'll tell you a little more. <laughs> well, I want to share with you something that will help you and... Uh, since we won't have a great opportunity for ministry afterwards, we'd have to trust that God can use the message to give you the keys to help your own journey forward. And uh, so I want to just talk today on inner healing. I'd like you to open your Bible with me, and we'll have a look in uh, John chapter 16, and we'll look in verse 33. And the first thing we see, and even Jesus speaks about it, as everyone has painful experiences in life, no exceptions. We're not born into heaven, we're born into earth. <laughs> and earth is a war zone, there are conflicts, there are challenges, there are difficulties, there's a spirit world that's hostile to us, and we live in a fallen uh, nation, fallen generation. And so conflicts are inevitable. And uh, so the Bible tells us, this is Jesus' words, look at this. He said, I've spoken these things to you, so that in me you might have peace. So we don't need to live a life of turmoil. We can have peace. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. So he says that in the world we live, it's inevitable that we will face pressures. The word tribulation means pressure or turmoils or conflicts. So Jesus said, it's inevitable you'll face pressures and conflicts. They're part of life. They happen in family. They happen in every area of life. It's not that we welcome them or even try and make them happen. It's just part of living in a fallen world. And many of the stresses and pressures, unfortunately, come right in our home environment in family itself. And Jesus said, uh, in, in the world you'll have tribulation, but have courage. He said, because I have overcome the world. So God himself and the person of Jesus Christ came into the world and Jesus experienced every kind of pressure, every kind of painful experience and setback that you could imagine. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he's a man of sorrows, fully acquainted with grief. So he understands what pain, difficulties, pressures and stresses are. But the Bible tells us clearly that in all of these, he overcame. And so he says, have courage because I have overcome. And that word overcome means, is the word Nikeo, from which we get Nike, to conquer, to get the prevailing victory. So whatever situation you are facing today, however painful it is, God promises you that Jesus has already overcome. And by receiving Jesus into your life, you have the capacity to overcome as well, whatever situation you're facing. I have found it's very common for people to think like a victim. A person who thinks like a victim is always blaming someone. They blame 
their background. They blame their father. They blame their mother. They blame this and that. It's common in so many cultures. But when we blame someone else, we assign to someone else the responsibility for our condition and our pain, then we become powerless. We become unable to break through. So one of the most important steps in breaking out of or breaking free of any painful circumstance in life is to stop blaming someone else. Stop blaming your bad luck. Stop blaming the government. Stop blaming uh, your family background. Stop blaming your friends and make a decision. I'll take responsibility for my life, for who I am and how I live my life. It's a major thing. So conflicts and difficulties are inevitable. Now, when someone has an accident and they fall over and damage themselves, it's always very obvious. There's blood or something got broken. And the first response you have when you are in pain, when you've injured yourself physically, is to try to protect yourself from further injury. We try to control the pain. We try to stop anyone touching us again or touching that area. So if you've damaged your hand, you reach out to shake someone's hand, you whoop, I don't think so. I don't want someone to hurt me again. So we naturally and instinctively try to protect ourselves when we're in pain. That happens when physical pain. Not only that, we try and cover over the wound because we also recognize that if we don't cover a wound, an open wound, then infections will get in and it will get much, much worse. So we understand those things about physical conditions. But I want to apply this to the heart. The Bible says you're a spirit man with a soul living in the body. And so you have an inner man. And just as your outer man can be damaged, your inner man can also be damaged. Your spirit can be wounded. Your soul can be damaged. Traumatic experiences in life create an impact. Uh, we don't always see it. It's not obvious. A physical wound is obvious, but wounds in the soul are not so obvious. But they always have a way of making their way out of our life. That's why in Proverbs 4.23 it says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from your heart flows the issues of your life. So if you have been injured and never resolve the conflict, never resolve what's happened to you, it will find its way out of your life somehow. And so not only that, there are other possibilities. So when we have an inner pain, inner damage to our soul, perhaps a person's been physically abused or perhaps a person in their home has been continually scolded, continually criticized, continually, no matter how hard they tried, continually faults being found in them, it hurts them. I know what it's like as a younger person growing up to work hard to please my parents or please my father and to find no matter how hard I worked, it never seemed to be quite good enough. And that affects you after a while, it begins to affect you inside, what you believe, the way you look at life. You become frustrated and hold anger and resentment and you begin to strive to cope. So th these are common things that happen to people. And we want to look at some of the ways we respond and I want to show you how you can process them and deal with them. For many people, they just try to bury the sorrow and pain. I had a girl spoke to me one day after church and she said, I wonder if you could help me, Pastor. I said, what's the problem? She said, I'm going to a family engagement, a family uh, gathering. It's the first time we've gathered since I was very young. And I said, what is the problem? She says, I'm very afraid of going to that gathering. Said, what are you afraid of? And she said, I'm afraid I'm going to really lose it and get angry. I said, well, why would you be so angry? Why would this happen? What has given rise to this? And she said, when I was 14, my brother and his friend sexually abused me. And I buried this and kept it as a secret in my heart. And I have never spoken to my brother and never spoken to his friend. I've never met them since that time. And she said, I am terrified that when I go home and I see my brother, I'm absolutely going to erupt and all that's in me will come out. And uh, it will ruin the celebration. And I talked with her and I said, let me help you. He said, what happened to you? I said, how many times did it happen? She said, just once. I said, well, then what happened to you was very wrong and very evil. There is no excuse for what was done to you. Your brother and his friend 
did not love you, they actually hated you. If they had loved you, they'd never have done such a thing. I said, it's left a traumatic mark in your life. These things should never happen. They're wrong and they're evil. But I said, that happened once many years ago. And now here you are, and you're full of anger, full of rage, full of bitterness, and full of fear. I said, those things are yours. You're not responsible for what they did, but you are totally and fully responsible for the anger and the bitterness and the rage you're holding in your heart. And I said, what they did was motivated out of hate and anger, but here it is. Now the hate and anger in them has become part of you. And you have to actually take responsibility. So with that, she began to scream. And she just literally screamed her head off. She was manifesting. And the spirit, evil spirits had got into her life. And that day she got a massive deliverance. She got set free from the spirits that had come in. And she also found it in her heart to release forgiveness to her brother and the friend and was able to go to that place and have the family function. And there was no problem like she'd anticipated. Because she had never resolved the pain in her heart, because she never dealt with the issue in her heart, it was an open wound. The Bible makes it very clear that evil spirits will enter our life where we have these kinds of open wounds. In Ephesians, let's have a look in Ephesians 4 and verse 27. Ephesians 4 and verse 27. Uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 27 says this. It says, we'll pick it up in verse 26. Be angry, but don't sin. Neither let the sun go down on your anger. Neither give place to the devil. And so what it tells us here is it's possible for you by reactions in your heart, by attitudes you hold, it's possible for you to make a doorway or a legal ground for an evil spirit to come into your life. How do evil spirits get into people's lives? Well, they certainly don't knock on the door and wait to be invited. They come in without you realizing it. And so what happened is, the Bible tells us, uh, uh, really, there are two ways that demons come into your life. One, you do things that give them a legal right to access your life. They have a, a door of opportunity given to them. Or traumatic experiences happen and you get wounded in your emotions and soul and carry grief and pain or trauma. And what happens is demons use that as a doorway into your life. Probably the best way I could describe uh, something that's like this. When you have a traumatic experience, uh, what happens is there's a shock in your soul and the injury is spread through your soul. So you're not always remember it or conscious of it. You have a car accident, many times you can't remember what happened. But when we have a trauma, a life trauma experience, a physical assault, a sexual assault, or a dramatic breakdown, the, the pain is dispersed in the soul, and we try our best to control and cover it. But if we don't resolve it properly, God's way, then demonic spirits can come in and walls begin to build in our heart. It's quite a painful thing. There are many examples in the Bible of people who never resolved issues in their heart and it had tragic consequences for them. If you think of uh, David's wife, Michael, David and Michael were both abused by Saul. They were both uh, treated very unjustly. David was treated as a criminal. Saul sought to murder him. His wife was given over to another man. Even though she loved David, she was given to another man. And so she had to live with another man as husband and wife, although her heart was with her husband. And this traumatically affected both of them. But David resolved his sorrow. David resolved his pain and his grief. David resolved his anger, but Michael, his wife, didn't. And when the time came in 2 Samuel 6, uh, in verse 16, where they were together again and they were in their place of their inheritance she was bitter and became barren and he excelled as a leader in a nation we have to choose how we respond to what life dishes out to us and we want to talk with you and show you about that we'll go and look in uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 at the ministry of Jesus Luke 4 and verse 18 we're gonna have a look at the ministry of Jesus there are other people who harbored issues in their heart. Another example is Esau. Esau was terribly angry, enraged 
at, at the fact that his younger brother seemed to have ripped off his inheritance or, or unjustly got the blessing of his father. And the Bible says of Esau, he comforted himself in his heart, purposing he'd kill his brother. How about that? He found comfort that when dad was gone, he would kill his brother. And I found that many people harbor anger and hate in the heart and it just erupts in relationships in a very destructive way. Let's have a look at the ministry of Jesus though. It says in verse 18, now the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So the anointing of the Holy Ghost was upon Jesus for a purpose. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives to set at the recovery of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So you notice that Jesus is anointed by the Holy Ghost. The power of God is on him. He's on a mission, and this outlines his mission. And notice the first thing is to proclaim the gospel to the poor. God's first priority is for you to break free of the power of sin and come into relationship with him. Jesus came to offer us free uh, forgiveness of sins. He came to show us that by faith in Him and trust in Him, we could be reconciled to God. Our first issue in life always is to be reconciled to God, to deal with the issue of sin. Sin separates us from God. When we're born into this world, we're born separate from God and we have no relationship with Him. We just do the best we can. And when we go through difficulties, we just try to control our life the best we can, control our heart the best we can. But when we come to God, when we open our life to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes in. We're born again. Our sin is forgiven. The power of sin is broken. We have a fresh start with God. But it doesn't end there. Notice the second thing it says is, He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That means that the condition of people is not just that we have sin in our life but our capacity to be intimate in relationship has been damaged as well. How do you get a broken heart? And what is a broken heart anyway? It's not your physical heart it's referring to. It's talking about your soul, your emotions, your thought life. Person who has a broken heart, the only way your heart can be broken is if you have been connected closely to someone. So it's usually in families that the heart gets broken. It's usually because of disappointments, of conflicts, difficulties. The heart is wounded in, in grief and in pain. And in that pain, we try to protect ourselves and we damage ourselves even further. So Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Why did he want to heal the brokenhearted? Why does he place this on such a high priority? It's because God has designed us for relationship. For you to have relationships, your heart must be free to give yourself. I have found many people cannot give themselves in a relationship. And the reason is because there's too much pain and they built too many walls. They built walls to protect themselves and now they want intimate relationship. They can't because there's a wall and a barrier around the heart. I'll explain what some of them are a little later and then show you how you can be free of those things. So he came to heal the brokenhearted, came to proclaim liberty to the captives. So deliverance from evil spirits is closely connected to the issues of your heart. So if you have been uh, perhaps uh, betrayed by someone very deeply, the first thing is you have the grief of the betrayal, then you have your reaction to it, how you responded in anger, bitterness, resentment, inner vows, whatever you've done to protect your heart or react to the situation, and demons come in on the top of that. So God's plan and desire includes that we be free in our heart, free from the damage of traumatic experiences. I found in Taiwan, there's <clears throat> such an increase in families breaking down, increase in marriages breaking down, increase in families, uh, children in the church are from broken families, and they come with a broken heart. We had a meeting last week and I shared on dealing with the issues with your parents. God says this, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may live long. And the implication is if you don't honor your parents from your heart, then it will create issues for you in your life. And we had hundreds of people, many of them young people, 
and they just began to weep and sob as they acknowledged how hurt they had been by being abandoned by a father, abused by a father, abandoned by a mother, they had gone through family traumas and came, now here they were in the church, saved, but desperately broken, needing healing. Jesus came to do this. He came to help you. He wants to help you. He's helped us. Uh, I want you to have a look with me in Psalm 84. Psalm 84. And we're going to look through Psalm 84 and find some keys in the journey of being healed. Joy and I have had to walk through this ourselves. Let's just read through the verse in verse 5 through to verse 7. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage or on journey or on process. They pass through the valley of Barca and make it a spring or a well, and the rain also fills it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. So the Bible is talking about a valley, a valley called the Valley of Baca, the Valley of Weeping. It's talking about an experience of sorrow in a person's life. And I want to share with you some keys. It tells us in this passage some of the keys to get out of the Valley of Sorrows. It's never God's plan that you remain in the Valley of Sorrow. It's never God's purpose that you are stuck in your life in a place of sorrow. Abraham's father-in-law, uh, Terah, had a son called Haran. His son was deeply close to his heart. His son died prematurely, and he never got over it. And in his journey forward, when he came to a town called Haran, it so reminded him of the grief in his heart, he refused to journey any further in God's plan. It's very easy for you, when you have a brokenness or a pain in your heart, to build walls and refuse to journey in relationships. And I want to show you how I can change that. You notice it said, they go from uh, strength to strength. They make it a well. So the Bible is very clear in this, that even though you may experience sorrow in your life, you can turn it into a well of life. You can make a change. And I want to share with you some simple keys how you can do that. You can turn your well into a place of life. Now, most people tend to just lock their heart up and shut their heart down and bury the pain. There's a Chinese word for endure, and it has a heart with a knife over the top of it. This is not God's way of enduring. God's way of enduring is not to stab your heart to death and stop feeling the pain. The implication in that picture, endure, is that you, you numb out the pain, you refuse to acknowledge your hurt, you just tough it out and show face. <laughs> That's not God's way. God's way is to heal your heart. And to heal your heart, you have to access it. So one of the things that's wonderful is the promise that if you will journey through painful experiences in your life, you can turn your valley where you were in a bad place into a well that can bless others. I've been coming here for many years and doing deliverance for many years and ministering to people for well, about 20 years, I think it is, have been coming here. People ask sometimes, well, how did you get into this ministry? How did you do this? We turned our valley into a well. That's how we did it. We had some very painful experiences. And I want to share with you just a little bit about that, and then we'll give you some of the keys of how you can get out of it. Uh, both Joy and I came from religious backgrounds. I came from very strong Catholic backgrounds. She was from a brethren background. We met at university and studied science. I did a master's degree in physics. She did a chemistry degree in science. And so we met there and we fell in love. She's the first girl I've ever really had a relationship with and uh, the only girl really. And uh, I uh, fell in love with her immediately. We're in the same classes every day. We're in the same class. We got a chance to meet and mix. I just thought and still think she's the most wonderful person in the world. And so that's many years ago. We were both 18. I was 18. She was 17. And uh, so we met many, many years ago, and we met at, at, at university. But the problem was that there was, in those days, extreme prejudice or extreme reaction from both families to, not just to the relationship, but there was uh, a, a reaction to, uh, that was based on religious grounds. And, and neither one wanted the relationship to proceed. 
not because we didn't love one another or they didn't like us, it was because of religious grounds. In other words, we faced on the one hand a love for one another and feeling in our hearts we were there, we were actually, uh, this, this is the person for me for my life. First time I took Joy out, I thought this is the one for me for my life. I knew in my heart this is her, this is the one. I just knew straight away. But families both put pressure on us. And the result of that was Joy kept breaking up. And so it was an extremely painful process. We'd uh, break up and then we're still in the same classes. And, and it was a, an incredibly painful process. And the process went on and off for quite a long time. And there was no way we seemed to be able to resolve it. But uh, Joy's family, there was a lady there who was praying and she was praying for me. She prayed for many years that I would get a breakthrough. But the relationship after six years, uh, towards the seventh year, uh, Joy got pregnant. Our relationship took a downward turn because of all the grief and pain. She became pregnant. And rather than, we, we were both stunned and shocked. We didn't really know what to do. In those days, there's tremendous shame in the culture associated with an unmarried mother. Uh, and, and we were both the first children. We were both in tremendous fear what to do. And because we lived in another city, uh, it was possible for us to conceal what was happening. So we made what would be one of the most tragic mistakes in our life. We chose to conceal uh, what we had done, to cover what we had done, and to adopt our baby out. And uh, it was a traumatic experience for Joy to go to hospital with her first child and then to adopt her first child out. Absolutely traumatic experience. And so to cope with the pain, she had to close her heart up to try and handle the pain of loss of a child. And likewise, even though I never saw uh, my child, I also had to close my heart up over this whole situation. And there was an area we never talked. We just didn't talk about it. And both of our lives were in turmoil. So we, at that stage, I was so desperate, I began to cry out to God and just really cried that God somehow would help us. And uh, that was November, we had the baby. Then uh, the following year, uh, we were able to get engaged and we got married the following August. But it was in both of us this deep sadness that here we are married, but our first child is gone. And there was a dark secret in our life. There'd be many of you here have secrets in your life. You have areas of your life which you've kept secret and those places of secrecy are places spirits get in and create problems for you. They create turmoil for you and unless you bring it to the light and let Jesus heal you, unless you resolve it, it just gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better and it continues to affect your future and your relationships. After we were married, we started to have other children. We now have six, seven children all together. Had another six, we've got seven children all together. And uh, we began to, we had a call into ministry. We got involved in a Christian school, involved in pastoring, began to pastor a church and grow. But uh, all the time, there was this ache in the heart. And when I got married, the day I got married, I made a decision to receive Jesus into my life. I asked him to become uh, into my heart on the day I got married, just before we exchanged our wedding vows. And I made a vow before God that one day when he brought our daughter back into our life, that I would openly let people know who she was. Because I had rejected her uh, because of the shame of our whole situation. I made a decision I would never do that ever again. I'd be very open, no matter where I was in life or what I was doing. And uh, I made that covenant before God. Now, in those days, there was closed adoption. So the law made it impossible for you ever to see your child again. But in my heart, I knew that one day God would find a way to bring her back. And our daughter is with us today. With us today. It's been the most amazing thing that God has done. The most amazing thing that God has done. And so I wouldn't think of not talking about it because of a covenant I made with God so many years ago. You know, the foundation for all change in our life is repentance. We have to actually take responsibility for our failures and totally repent of them and turn to God's way. God has a way. In Isaiah 30, it tells us in returning or repenting and entrusting God, you'll be saved. In quietness and confidence, you'll find rest in your soul. It's important to choose God's way. 
And at that stage, we didn't choose God's way. And so years went by, and we came to a point where we decided to have a uh, marriage uh, renewal. And so we gathered some couples together, and we looked at the foundations of marriage, and we opened our hearts to one another, and, and we walked through the journey of repentance and facing the walls of the heart, dealing with the walls of the heart. Because when people are hurt, you have to build a wall, you have to protect yourself somehow. So if you hurt your hand, you'll cover your hand. But if you hurt your heart, what do you do? You build a wall of protection around it. So what are the walls of protection that people build? Well, there are many things that get into our heart that affect us. Uh, often, uh, deep bitterness and anger gets in the heart and just resides there over what's happened. Uh, often deep grief gets in the heart. And then to cover ourselves, we build a wall of, uh, of bitter judgments about people, uh, about men and about women. You can never trust a man. You never trust a woman. We build a wall to try and stop ourselves ever being hurt again. Or we make judgments uh, rooted in bitterness that, that stop us ever being able to connect with the person again. I'll never do this. I'll never do that. We make inner vows. I'll never let a man into my life. I'll never let a woman into my life. I'll never open my heart again. Those kind of things are inner vows, and they build walls in the heart that stop you ever connecting with your heart until you renounce them and break them and deal with them. And many times, people just make a death wish. They just wish I could die. And their heart closes up and their emotions shut down. So all of these are ways we control pain. But when we do that, it blocks intimacy. And so Joy and I knelt together one night as God showed us these things in our heart. And we repented and asked each other forgiveness. They had been in our marriage all these years. We just never talked about it. That's what many people do. They just don't talk about their issues. They leave them in the dark. And so we knelt one day and both of us wept as we realized the impact in our marriage and intimacy in our marriage of not resolving heart issues. And God just brought a tremendous breakthrough that day in our lives. Now within the year, the law changed. And so we wrote a letter to the authorities and, and Josephine's family also read a letter to the authorities. They arrived about the same time with pictures and stories. So suddenly uh, Josephine becomes aware that she has a family with six other brothers and sisters. And uh, she was very gracious and willing to come and meet us. So we paid for her to come, and the day she chose to come and meet us, uh, it was my birthday. She would have known, not have known that. It was just like a gift from God, really. And so we had a wonderful week, and we shared with the whole church about our lives and about our testimony, and many others opened up and shared their heart, and many others were free because we were free to share about our life. We're living in a, an era where people are looking for something authentic. And when you're authentic about your life, people feel they can connect and relate. Josephine came and we had the most, most amazing, wonderful time where God just poured his love out in so many different ways on us as a family. And over the years, she kept coming back into our family life. And uh, in the last uh, three or four years, we've had the great privilege. Uh, I was able to, she invited me to take her wedding. And so I was able to marry her. We, took the wedding service and God came in for the wedding service and into the reception, most powerful way. And uh, that was just an amazing gift of God. God is amazing what he can do. He's amazing. And uh, we're very, very grateful to Josephine for her own grace and her heart to allow that to happen. And uh, then last year, uh, Josephine and Steve asked if we would lead them to Jesus and baptize them. And so here they are today, part of the family of God. What an amazing miracle, eh? Only God could do something like that. What an amazing God we have. And so we are so grateful that the Lord not only totally turned it all around, but has done so much. When we gave up Josephine, there was no way under law we could ever see her again. And yet here she is. God does these amazing things. He does amazing miracles. But you have to journey with them. So let's have a look in the passage and see if we can draw a few keys in here. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage or on journey. So number one, the first thing we need to do is to turn to the Lord to help us when we're in a painful situation. The word strength means the ability to get victory, the ability to overcome. 
There are two ways you can try and overcome. One is you can try and overcome in your own ability and you'll find yourself always falling short. Or you can turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your ability. There's no situation you haven't overcome. I'm willing to trust you and open my heart to you. Help me, Lord. So the first thing is to turn to Jesus Christ. And it says then, it says, in whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Or the word pilgrimage means to make a journey. So healing involves both the power of God and encounter, but it also is a process. Healing doesn't, you can't always just lay hands on someone and fix the damage that's done over years. There's a journey we must commit to of growing and changing. So, uh, so the first step is to come to the Lord. And the second part is to stop controlling our life and be willing to accept God's process of going forward. And he has got a process. He has got a journey that we make our way forward. So let me share with you some of the steps in that process. Uh, you notice that the next step is, uh, basically is you have to face the reality of what happened. You have to face the truth. What happened and how did it impact you and how did you respond? You've got to ask those questions. If a father has betrayed the family, been involved in adultery and has left the family and this family suffered hardship, You've got to face the facts of what has happened and ask the questions, how did I feel? How did this affect me? And then how did I react? I prayed for one girl one time, uh, not so long ago actually, and she came to ask me for help and I said, uh, what's your problem? She said, uh, I've got this man and, uh, and uh, he wants to connect with me and we want to have a relationship and I need some advice. I said, tell me about him. She said, well, I was, he was a former boyfriend and we broke up. I said, really? She said, then I went and had a fling with another boy and had a child to that other boy, and now this one wants me back. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, why did you leave him in the first place? She said, well, he, he was unfaithful to me three times. I said, well, that's a good reason to leave him, probably after the first time. I said, was he a Christian? She said, no. I said, is he a Christian now? And she said, no. I said, well, he hasn't changed. So I said, you're about to get involved in a problem again. And anyway, I, I felt the Lord prompt me. I said, tell me about your father. How'd you get on with your father? I don't see my father. I don't have much to do with my father. I said, really? Is that so? Tell me what happened. She said, oh, my father and mother are separated. I said, why did they separate? And she said this, my father committed adultery three times with three different people. I said, do you see that there's any connection between your father and mother breaking up because of unfaithfulness and you now firstly being attracted to a man who was unfaithful and now you're still attracted to him. Can you see there's a connection there? She could not. I said, I'll tell you what it is. I said, you are bitter against your father and you have judged him that men will betray you and be unfaithful to you. And so now the Bible says, if you judge, you will be judged. You set in, in your life a cycle of reaping the judgment you've sown. She couldn't see it. I said, I'm sorry, I can't really help you because you won't face the truth of what your real problem is. Your real problem is not this young man. Your real problem is that you have bitterness in your heart against your father and all relationships with men will be affected by it. You need to let your heart be made clean by Jesus. It's quite sad. I remember another young man and he came to me for counsel and uh, I said, what's your problem? And, he's, and he was in conflict with a cell group leader. And I said, okay, so I got the cell group leader there and sat down and talked about it. I said, okay, what's going on here? And I listened to them and, okay. I said, well, tell me, uh, how do you get on with your boss at work? Oh, I don't get on with him at all. Oh, really? I said, how do you get on with your previous boss? I didn't get on with him at all. I said, well, did you ever have a job you liked? He said, yes, I was in the army. I loved it in the army. I said, how did you get on with the officers? Oh, I didn't get on with them. They picked on me. I said, really? I said, let me guess. You had trouble at school with your teachers as well. He said, how did you know? I said, really? Okay. I said, how'd you get on with your father? He said, he wasn't my father. He was my stepfather, and he kicked me out of the home. I said, so you had conflict with him as well? He said, yes. I said, I can see what your problem is. Your problem is you were adopted and you have heart bitterness against your father and your mother for rejecting you. 
And I said, it's showing up in anger and rebellion against every person who's in authority in your life. I said, this is not going to stop. It's going to continue. You will continue to have these conflicts until you address the issue of the heart. So that's why we ask the question, well, what happened? How did it impact you? And usually people are reluctant to share how it impacted them. But when they do, there's a lot of grief. It's okay to remember what's happened and to grieve before the Lord and let the sorrow out. Tears are the language of the heart. Then you've got to consider how you reacted. And some people react by becoming angry and bitter. Some by forming judgments against men or against women or against life. Some build inner vows. Some make death wishes. Some try to control the pain. Whatever you've done in way of reaction, you need to repent of it and let the power of the cross break it. You can't be free in your heart if you're still protecting your heart with your own ways. Blessed is the man whose strength is in God and whose heart is set on journeying with God. One of the easiest ways you can get to do this is to journal. And you write out and you begin to write out what has happened and what you felt and, and, and what was in your heart and, and, and how you've reacted to it. And then you come to a place where inevitably you have to forgive. Forgiveness is non-optional to going forward out of the valley of sorrows. Unforgiveness keeps you trapped in the valley of sorrow. Unforgiveness locks you emotionally and in your, your, your focus of your life back to the injustice. You say, well, it's not fair. I, I, I mean, they don't deserve it. No, we don't forgive people because they deserve it. We forgive people because it's God's ways of getting free. It's God's way of getting free. If you hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart, you are locked back to the problem situation. You're locked back and you can't get out of it. You actually have to come to a place of acknowledging how hurt and angry you are and releasing forgiveness. That is God's way out of the hole. If you don't, you, the Bible says Jesus taught Matthew 18, 34 and 35 that it will open a doorway for tormentors to come into your life. Of all the reasons I have discovered over years of ministering to people why people are tormented by demons, the number one of them all is unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness, it stops you getting the pain healed. It stops you moving on. It keeps your life open. And of course you say, well, what was done to me? Well, you don't understand what was done to me. No, I don't. And I have heard the most sad stories you could ever imagine. But always, forgiveness is the way out. We have to choose to forgive. And sometimes it's a process where we continue to forgive. But we must decide, I will not stay in a valley of sorrow. I will journey forward. So Joy and I had to choose to forgive. We had to repent. We had to let go. I had to make some apologies and put some things right. You've got to do what God says in order to get free. He says if you'll humble yourself, he will lift you up. So humility is always the path out, passing through the valley of sorrow. So grieve your loss, repent of your sin and ask Jesus to forgive you, and then release forgiveness. That opens the way for God to work in your life and in your heart. And I have found just the very act of journaling and writing down what I felt and what, how I'd affect, been affected and, and then releasing forgiveness, it opened the way for my heart to be free. Now, of course, you've got to continue in that place. So that means you've got to do some things as well as you walk on because sometimes the people that hurt us still hurt us. So you must make some decisions on how you're going to handle it. So one of the things you need to do is to renew your mind. So I had lived with a lot of hurt in my heart. And so what I did was I took time every day to meditate. I began to meditate that God was with me because I'd lived with so much loneliness and my heart so closed up that I couldn't believe or accept that God was with me. And so I took time to meditate in truth until the truth came into my heart and I could feel no longer alone and empty. I could feel God loving me. So meditation renews your mind, renews your thinking. And then I had to learn to capture negative thoughts as they would happen. A negative thought would come, you just stop it, confront it. No, I won't think that. I won't believe the worst, I'll believe the best. And then you choose to love the person because you only know you've passed from death to life when you can love. When you can truly reach out and give or be generous to someone who's hurt you, you know you're free. 
You say, but they don't deserve it. Well, it's not, you're not doing it because they deserve it. You're doing it because this is the person you have committed to become, a loving, generous, Christ-like person. These are the steps out. And it's a journey, it's a process, and it has moments of encounter. Deliverance is a wonderful way of getting set free and getting a release from the demonic empowerment, but we still have to journey and process our thinking, our ways of thinking. And I believe God wants to help many today. I'm going to lead you through a prayer, but let me just, I want to just pray for someone just in a moment. I want to just show you something. You see, if your heart is locked up with bitterness, your heart is locked up with unforgiveness, you then become isolated in your life. And one of the persons you're most isolated from is God, because God requires that we forgive others. It says when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so God can forgive you. So I have learned if I want to enjoy being in the presence of God, I must keep my heart full of forgiveness and grace. You know, when someone does something, you're either going to judge them and punish them, or you release grace and forgiveness. You just choose. So I took a lot of time to just meditate in God being with me. And it took me a little while to process the pain in my heart. But once I'd done it, I started to find if I would just meditate that God is with me, his presence would start to come around my life. And that's what we want to live in, the presence of God. Here, is this come on up? Just, just help me for a moment. It won't take just a moment to do this. Just hold my hand there, just like that. You just close your eyes. And what I have learned is this. God has designed you and I to be full of his spirit. He's designed us to be full of his love. So what I did was day after day, I would just meditate that God is with me. I think we'll need someone behind him because he's going to feel the power of God. I'm just holding his hand. I'm not going to try and pray for him in any way. What I'm going to do is just meditate in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is with me. And so I begin to meditate that Jesus is very near me. And I just open my heart to him. And his presence begins to come and touch me. And as he touches me, Eric's going to begin to feel his presence touching him too. Meditation opens our life to the reality of God. And you can't open your life to the reality of God if you have your heart full of baggage. He'll always speak to you and say, deal with it. Come on. Be bigger than that. Let it go. Don't be so angry. Don't be so bitter. Don't be so resentful. Let it go. Because holding on to it is robbing you from intimacy and connection. You need to let it go. Oh, there he is. Hey, come on. Just come. I have to try it too. There we go. It's on my hand. Just for a moment. You just close your eyes. And if I just close my eyes, I can immediately be in the presence of God. I just can see Jesus in my imagination. I see him right there before me. And as I see him there before me, I can open my heart and his presence just comes around me. And I feel the presence of God now. So because I can feel the presence of God, I can now bring God to others. So notice what that scripture said. Blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord, who passing through the valley of sorrow, you don't stay in the place of pain but you turn it into a well that can bring blessing to others. So the things that caused pain in my life, when I brought them to the Lord and they were resolved, become a well to minister. So I minister on healing, minister on deliverance, but I needed these myself. And it was as I made the journey, the process. You know, every day for day after day, I would stand and release forgiveness and bless people who'd hurt me and then take time to resist the spirits that would assault me and then just stand and meditate that God is with me. And, and God suddenly came. He just suddenly made his presence. Let me just come. Just come and show you. Come on, dear. Come on up. Just come. And see, so now it's so easy. I can just stand here and immediately feel the presence of God and whew, the power of God will just come and touch her. Just like that. And it's the most wonderful thing to be able to be in the presence of God and to carry the presence of God. That's right. Are you ready? Just close your eyes and look up and the power of God is there. Say it, praise the Lord. His power of God is there just straight away. You say, well, how do you do that? <laughs> it's not me doing something. It's a person I'm connected to. And you're all connected to him too, if you know Jesus Christ. I've just taken time to remove the blocks in my heart and come to become near him. And in coming near him and dealing with the blocks in my heart, 
I've been able to actually learn how to carry his presence. Can I pray for you, dear? Can I pray for you? If you could just come out of here and let me pray for you. And then we'll, I'd love you to have an opportunity. If you're here today and don't know Jesus, I'd love you to receive Jesus. God bless you. Just come here. Just let me take your hand. God loves you very much. But he, and he's, you've been through a lot of pain. And you've been through tremendous distress in your life. God understands the distress you've been and wants to help you tonight. He wants to help you. You've been abandoned. Right. But God will help you today. He wants to set you free. Just come, just open your heart to him right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. I come against the spirit of abandonment and grief. I command you to release her right now. In Jesus' name. Peace. Peace right now. And set her free. Now, 30 years she's been in pain. And spirits have come in to torment her. Now she'll feel peace. She'll still have to journey through any issues of forgiveness that are there. But you can see the benefit of me letting my heart be free is I can have a well of life to minister to others. All of us are called to have a well of life to minister to others. It's just we haven't thought about it very much. And we haven't worked with our heart with God very much. But today would be a good day for you to make a decision. So let's just close our eyes for a moment. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you're not a Christian yet, today's a great day to receive Jesus. Today's a great day to come to know Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, this is what Jesus said. He said, whoever receives him, whoever believes upon him, he gives power to become a child of God. If you're here today and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're living separated from God. You're living in a world of darkness and you have no way of solving the problems of life really except in your own strength. But today Jesus invites you to connect with him, begin the journey with him in being loved by him. He loves you. God so loved you. He sent Jesus into the world. He taught the things of the kingdom he ministered the power of God and then finally he died on the cross and rose again from the dead he broke the power of sin so we could be free I know today there's people here need Jesus if that's you today the way into the presence of God and the love of God is by receiving Jesus Christ would you raise your hand right now just please raise your hand right now Raise your hand right now wherever you are and you wish to receive Jesus, become a Christian. Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. Just put it up clearly so I can see. Put it up clearly. So God bless, God bless, God bless. That's right. Raise your hand. I want to become a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus. That's right. Raise your hand. Anyone else? That's right. Raise your hand. Just put your hand up clearly so I can see. Any person wanting to receive Jesus, become a Christian. God wants to touch. God bless us. See your hand over there too. Anyone else? This is an important decision to make. A decision to come to God, to open your life and begin a journey in life with God as your friend. It starts the first step by receiving Jesus. Would you raise your hand? Anyone else? Anyone else here today? God bless. I see your hand over there. Anyone else? God bless. Anyone else? God bless you, dear. Right down there. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand just clearly so I can see. God bless. God bless. There may be others and you're just wrestling with that decision. This is what we're going to do right now. We're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to stand up and give people who want to receive Jesus a chance to come forward. And then I'll just uh, pray with you. It'll only take a few minutes to pray with you. After that, I'm going to pray a corporate prayer. Unfortunately, we can't pray and minister to you individually because they're going to pull the facility apart and shift. But what we can do is believe for the power of God to come on you and touch many of you today where you are in your seat. So let's believe together for that. But first, let's stand together. And every person who wants to receive Jesus, make your way to the front. Please come. Please come, church. Let's give them a clap right now. Please come. Please come. Please come. This is your time to come to Jesus. Please come. Please come.
make your way to the front. People wanting to receive Jesus, please make your way to the front. I want to pray with you. God bless you, sir. Come on, God bless. I know there's others. Please come, please come. Bring your friends. Bring your friends to the front. God bless you. Come on, church, keep clapping. God bless you. People are coming to Jesus. Hey, God bless. God bless. People are coming to Jesus. Come on, church. Let's encourage them. Hey, God bless you, son. are still coming. It's not too late to come. Please bring your friends. You brought a friend with you who doesn't know Jesus. Ask them if they'd like to come. Hello. Please come. Please come. This is your day. God loves you. What better day to receive Jesus? Well, people are still coming. Church, just keep clapping. People are still coming. Ask your friend if they would like to come. Wonderful. People are still coming from the back. Nothing is impossible to God. He loves you deeply. Are we ready to come? Hey, good to see you. Anyone else? Is there anyone else? Please come, please come. How wonderful. People still coming. I want to thank you for responding today. This is a very good choice you're making. It's the decision to take the first step in walking with God. It's very difficult running our life without God. We often wonder where we're going and what the purpose of life is. But when we connect to Him, a peace comes in our heart. Jesus said, I give you my peace. So he promises a peace in our heart. It's the peace of knowing we're connected personally with God through Jesus Christ. We'll lead you in a prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. When we talk to God and we mean what we say, he always listens. The Bible says he's not far from any one of us. Not far at all. Very close. He's close to you. He's just one prayer away. So let's just close our eyes. When you close your eyes, everyone goes away. It's just you and the Lord. And I want you just to listen to the prayer I pray. And then everyone, we're all going to repeat it together. It's called the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer to open the door of our heart to Jesus Christ to come in. God will hear this prayer. Whatever you've done, no matter how shameful, whatever's been done to you, God will release forgiveness to you immediately. He will write your name in heaven. This is my child. She's in my family. He's in my family. Okay, let's just pray a prayer now, the sinner's prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I turn away from all sin. I turn away from from idols and false gods. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I ask you to forgive all my sins and give me a fresh start. I receive your Spirit into my heart and I give you my life today. Before heaven and earth, I declare. Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior and, and my friend forever. And my friend forever. Amen. Amen. Just remain quiet. Lord, let your love and peace.
Just come upon each one. Touch them, Lord, with your loving presence. He loves you. He loves you. Receive it right now. He loves you. Receive his presence right now. He loves you, dear. Receive his touch right now. The presence of God is here. Son, God loves you. He knows what you've been through. Horrendous background and terrible pain that you've gone through. God wants to help you. Father, today in Jesus' name, I just break the spirit of idolatry and all the generational curses going with it. <coughs> Father, thank you, Lord. Touch him, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. How wonderful. Welcome to God's family. Welcome to the great family of God that's found in every nation, every place in the world is people who love Jesus. And you're part of that family today. God loves you. Touch you, Lord, right now. Touch you with your presence right now. Touch you with your presence right now. Hey, God loves you. Holy Ghost, come on her right now. The presence of God is here. Oh, God wants to heal your broken heart. All that stuff with your Father. Loose you right now. Thank you, Lord. Touch you right now, Jesus. My Holy Spirit, come on him. Oh, Son, God loves you. Holy Spirit. Power of God. Power of God. Just touch him. Power of God. Set him free. Power of God. The power of God. Touch you, Lord. Touch you. Touch you. Wow. Church, let's give them a great clap. Let's give them a great clap. Welcome to the family of God. God bless. Touch your Amen. God bless you. Church, one more time, let's give all our new friends a big round of applause. Welcome to the house of God, to the family. And uh, how many of you have been tremendously blessed by the ministry of Pastor Mike Connell? Let's give him a big round of applause as well. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. You. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, for those of you who are in the front, I just want you to know that behind you, there is a counselor that would like to pray for you and would like to give you this free gift. So uh, after the service is over, you can immediately uh, you know, pray for them, the counselors, and take down their particulars. But I just want to make known to you that Pastor Mike has his uh, Facebook and all his particulars. And uh, you can read about his ministry and you can also get to hear of his many other podcasts that's available yeah, yeah. out there, mikeconnellministries.com. And I think many of you will be tremendously blessed. And for those of you who are leaders here, this coming Tuesday, we're going to have a combined leaders meeting with Pastor Mike Connell. There will be a time of ministry. And for those of us in the SOT, the whole entire week, Pastor Mike Connell will be with you. And it will be a time of uh, setting free in Jesus' name. That's right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, before we end today, we have been blessed. But I just want to say... We just want to pray for one area and that is in the area of forgiveness and if you need forgiveness if you need to really let go let's pray that the power of god will help you so that you and i can move on and forgive somebody i just want you to lift up your hands and and sense the presence and the power of god today okay all right we're just going to get pastor mike connell to just pray for us if you need to forgive if you need to let go, that's right. Let's reach out to touch Jesus. That's right. Just release the forgiveness right now. As God shows you the person, puts the face in front of you. Father, I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. In Jesus' name, I bless them. Now in Jesus' name, we break the spirit of bitterness, forgiveness, hatred, death. We break their hold over people's life. We release the presence of God, healing, touching people's lives in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending your servant and the word of God to set us free because the truth has certainly set us free. So, Father, today, as we walk in forgiveness, give us a newness of life. Father, let every single relationship that has been broken be healed completely and bring back reconciliation. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and everybody say, let's give Jesus one more big hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, 
Before we go, we want to sing one praise song And of course the counsellors, you can go ahead Take down the particulars and pray for them right now Let's sing one praise song for Jesus Give Hallelujah. God a big hand Come on. Praise you Jesus You are awesome in this place Come on, sing together with me God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead of you. And next week, see you in Singapore Expo, not in Suntec Convention Hall. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen.